Hello there and welcome back. So in this uh, lecture we're going to talk about the factors determining clay reactivity. So we're going to identify the kaolinite as the dominant parameter and then talk about how to determine the kaolinite content. So our research has shown that to have a clay that's suitable for the LC3 technology, you really need to have a kaolinite content of about 40% or above. And here we're going to look at how you can measure that kaolinite content, including very simple methods that can be used uh, really by almost anybody, and um, then how you take all that information together to see if your clay is suitable. On this graph here, what we see is the very important result of the relationship between the kaolinite content of the clay and the strength that's developed in a mortar. And you can see really there's a linear correlation um, between these two. And the little dotted lines here show the reference strength of the pure OPC cement. So what we can see here at seven days is that if we have a kaolinite content above about 40%, then we'll have a similar strength to the reference of Portland cement. And this is why we say above 40% is really what you need. And the other factor that emerges from this data is that these clays were taken from many different places in the world. They have different uh, secondary minerals. Um, many other factors varying, but those factors make very little difference because of these very high correlations we see just with the kaolinite content. So kaolinite content is really what you want to know about to determine if your clay is suitable. Now here we see the thermal decomposition curves for the different clay types. And all these curves show a a stage where heat is taken in, which is where we have the loss of hydroxyls in the crystalline structure, and then a point where heat is given out where we get recrystallization. And what is important is we want to be between these two points. We want to have lost the water for the, from the clay because then this gives an amorphous structure which is reactive, but we don't want to have recrystallization because once we have recrystallization, then the material becomes inert. And we see that for the kaolinite, which is the important one here, we have this very uh, nice large area in which we can calcine our clays to have reactive materials before recrystallization occurs. If we look at the different clay types, what we see here is their potential to react with calcium hydroxide. That's to say to be pozzolanic. And so we see here for the two blue ones, which are the kaolinitic clays, that here from very early ages, the calcium hydroxide content is much lower than in the reference. So this is showing that we have a very early and very strong reactivity of the kaolinitic clays. If we take the other clay types, on the other hand, if we look, for example, at the elytic clays, which are these green ones here, we see that really they don't lower the calcium hydroxide content at all. Um, in fact, it's a little bit higher than our reference here uh, because of so-called filler effect. And uh, the marinolite shows some reactivity, but this is really at much later ages, well beyond 30 days. So this is not really that much use uh, from a practical standpoint. And this really highlights how, you know, it's really so important to focus on clays with this kaolinitic content. And as we saw in the last lecture, the reactivity of kaolinite, it comes from its crystal structure. We have these layers which are composed of uh, one part of silicate tetrahedra, one part of aluminate octahedra. These oxygen here would be coordinated with hydroxyls and it's the loss of these from the structure that gives you this amorphous structure which is reactive and um, can then act as a pozzolan. Now this dehydroxylation occurs between 500 and 650. 
Now, the first stage, you can make a very um, a rough idea of how much kaolinite you may have in your clay by making an x-ray fluorescence analysis. This is typically uh, a very simple test to do. And because of the different ratio between silica and alumina in the two, one clay, two to one clays versus the one to one clays, you can see the balance of silica and alumina is very different. In the one to one clays, we have much more alumina and much less silica. And this can be the first indicator that can enable you to choose the right clay type. Here we can see that a first indication can come from the chemical composition. However, the chemical composition is difficult to turn into a quantitative figure because there may be other minerals present which may confuse the analysis. And for that reason, it's much better to make an assessment by thermal uh, weight loss. Here we see the thermal differential thermal weight loss of the different clay types. And you can see this very clear step here for the weight loss of the kaolinite between about 450 and 650. And if you want to, um, if you don't have a sophisticated thermal gravimetric uh, analysis device, you can actually just measure this by a very simple technique using two ovens. What we need to do is first of all get the dry weight before this weight loss step, that's at about 400, and then, then the weight after this weight loss step, but before that of other clay materials, at about 650. So what you can do with just two ovens, you can measure the weights at these two points, uh, as is shown in the next slide here. So you may want to dry first and then make a, uh, a weight loss at 400 and then 650 and take the difference. So typical clay deposits, which we may call low-grade clays, these are very white, abundant all around the uh, world, uh, will contain various different elements, there may be water, there may be some sand or quartz, organic matter, other non-clay minerals, quartz, feldspar, pyrite, etc, etc, and of course the clay minerals, which is what interests us. If we then have made all these steps and we can calculate the amount of alumina, we've calculated the weight loss by our thermal analysis or by the oven technique and we have the other materials present, we can then uh, map out whether the clays are suitable. And what we really want to be is in this zone 1, which has kaolinite contents above 60%, and these clays will be very reactive. Clays in zone 2, shown here, between 40 and 60% kaolinite, will also show good reactivity. And finally, these ones down here will have kaolinite contents below 40%, tend to have a large proportion of 2 to 1 clays, and these will be fairly poorly reactive. Uh, and finally, of course, in zone four, we have other uh, calcium rich or sulfur rich minerals, which tend to um, confuse the analysis because they give weight losses, which are not due to dehydroxylation. So that information is just summed up here. The kind of threshold we have for good reactivity would be a mixture of, say, 60% quartz, 40% kaolinite. That would have the figures which are indicated here. And then um, if we want to be a little bit more conservative to really make sure we have something of good quality, we would recommend these figures here. Above 18% alumina content, an alumina to silica ratio of 0.3, and a, a, a loss on ignition between 400 and 650 of 7%. If we have to be careful of some other things, if the calcium content is above about 3%, then uh, there may be a problem with uh, contents of calcite or gypsum, so it's best to be below 3. Sulfur is best to keep below about 2 to make sure you don't have too much pyrite or alanite or gypsum. And iron is not too much of a problem if you don't mind about the color, but if you want to have something with a nice pale color, then keep this should be kept below about 10%. However, as we'll talk in a later lecture, you can actually correct the color by controlling the oxidation reduction conditions in the kiln. 
So what are the other requirements we have for our clays? Well, clearly, a very important one is to know if there are other sources of supplementary cementitious materials in the area. Because if we have things like fly ash, uh, clearly this is a resource that should be used uh, rather than exploiting uh, new clay. Otherwise, if we have natural pozzolans, these are also materials that can work well with, with cement. So that's a ma ma major factor. And the advantage that fly ash and natural pozzolans have, of course, is they don't have to be calcined, and this will generally make them cheaper than calcined clays. The distance to the cement part is important, but you can normally have distances up to even 100 kilometers. Uh, we have shown in preliminary economic analysis that this can be viable. And then if you're going to exploit a new resource, you need to really uh, work out how much your reserves are and whether this is long enough, uh, whether this is enough to have an operation which can continue uh, for a long time. So just to sum that up, what we've seen in this lecture is that kaolin light is by far the most important factor to determine clay reactivity. And in the next lecture, we're going to look at how we can, uh, should work out the temperature for the calcination. Okay, so thank you and see you next time.